next up we have Zoe de Beuze. Am I pronouncing your name right? Yes. Uh, who's going to tell us about using machine learning uh, to model activity signals. Um, yeah, so my name is Zoe DeBurst, I'm a first year PhD student at MIT, and I've been working on this project with Andrew Vanderberg since undergrad, so about three years now, um, and it's focused on using various machine learning methods like neural networks to try to model stellar activity signals in radial velocity searches, both for Harp's North Solar observations, um, as well as some of the express observations that Lily told us about earlier today, um, and some other targets as well. Um, yeah, so I, let's see, there we go. Um, so I structured the talk kind of first talking about our results for the solar data from Harps North, which we already heard a lot about today from some other um, people. And then secondly, I'll talk about how we modified our machine learning methods to work on a smaller data set um, of a specific extrasolar system called K2167. Um, to try to see if we would be able to remove the stellar activity noise and actually reveal the mass that was previously wow. hidden. Um, and then I'll conclude with some of these same kind of simplified linear regression methods that we used on the express observations. Um, yeah, so first off, as a reminder, I just want to remind everybody that when we're looking at the cross-correlation functions or kind of looking at how we measure the overall line spectrum, planets are going to be introducing translational shifts to CCF. Um, whereas when we're looking at the stellar activity changes in the form of spots and collages, what's happening is that it's changing the line shape of the CCF, um, which sometimes can make it really hard to figure out what the sensor is and therefore make it seem like there might be a translational shift. Um, but these are qualitatively different kinds of changes in the CCF. Um, and so what we were trying to do is to train a neural network to recognize that difference between a translational shift and between a shape change. Um, specifically, we wanted to see whether neural networks would be able to predict um, the stellar activity noise contribution or stellar activity in general contribution to the radial velocity signal um, using those shape changes that are being induced. Um, so you might wonder, what information do you actually give your neural network? Um, so what you can see here is for the Harps North Solar Telescope dataset, um, we have a CCF of interest on the left-hand side with the SDO image that corresponds to that specific observation, um, and then a quiet reference observation. We do not see any spots or pages, um, and it's kind of hard to see the actual difference between the two. So what we do is we subtract this quiet reference observation to get a residual CCF instead. Um, and so this is the only thing that the neural network will see at one time. It will not include any kind of timing information, um, and we're doing this primarily because we hoped that if this would work, it wouldn't require the high cadence sampling um, that some other methods like GPs often would require. Um, and so, um, so we use three different kinds of neural network architectures. Commonly, people will try to get the architecture complexity to model the amount of data that you're using as well as the complexity of the actual observations. Um, so the linear Neural network architecture is the same thing as essentially having just a linear regression. Um, you don't have any hidden layers, so it's like a zero hidden, uh, zero hidden neural network. Um, and so each of the lines just represents like the weights that you're fitting for in a linear regression, essentially. Um, for the fully connected one, you have the CCFs that are being put as inputs, and then each of these lines also represent like multiplicative weights that the model is learning as it's training on a whole bunch of observations. Um, and then the fully connected layers represent a hierarchy of learned features um, by the model, which then finally predict an output, which in our case is going to be that cellular activity contribution to the radial velocity signal. And um, we also tested a convolutional neural network um, where instead the convolutional layers are going to take an input vector um, and then take a discrete cross correlation um, with the learned kind of kernel vectors that the model learns as it's training. And so we compared all three of these architectures. Um, but before we did that, we split our data set into training, validation, and testing sets. Um, and so this is kind of, for people who might not be super familiar, kind of the golden standard um, in machine learning methods. Um, so 
what you essentially are doing with the training set is training your observations, trying to learn all of those weights that I was talking about, as well as some of those like kernel vectors. Um, and then you will evaluate how well your model is working on the validation set. And you might change certain hyperparameters, such as like how deep your neural network is, maybe like the speed at which it's learning, things like that. Um, and then you might kind of keep on tweaking those hyperparameters until you get good performance. Um, and then finally, you will freeze all of your hyperparameters. You're not allowed to change your model anymore. And then you evaluate it on the test set. So it's kind of a good way to make sure that you're not like overfitting or those kinds of things. Um, we did it a little bit differently than this, um, mainly because um, kind of this 80-10-10 split is commonly done for um, data sets that have thousands of observations. Um, we had on the order of 600 observations instead. Um, and so what we did was a k-fold cross-validation procedure, meaning that we took out 10% of the 80% train on like that 70% evaluate and kind of keep on doing that until you've taken out each of them um, so that you kind of get an aggregate result across that whole 80% um, because we were concerned that otherwise um, we would kind of overfit on that validation sample. Um, yeah, so what we then find is for our best model, which you can see here on the top row, you have like the raw radio velocities from our north solar observations. These are what the neural network predicts them to be. And so we just subtract that from the top panel to get the like stellar activity corrected radio velocities. Um, here you can see like a GIF kind of of the neural network in action. So you see like on the top panel what the neural network sees. And then on the bottom, like what it predicts the stellar activity contribution to be corresponding to that like residual CCF that I was talking about. Um, yeah, it's a little bit slow, so we might kind of go to the next slide. <laughs> um, okay. Bye. Yes, there you go. Um, yeah, so overall, we found that with these three different architectures, for the best one, the convolutional neural network, we reduce the stellar activity noise by a factor of about 1.7. Um, for the Hartz North Solar data sets, um, but across the three methods, it's pretty comparable. Um, and so, yeah, for the best one, it goes from 1.75 meters per second raw scatter to a scatter of about 1.04 across the entire data set when you do that whole cross validation procedure. Um, yeah, so here you can see those same results in Fourier space with lump scribble periodograms. So, in the top panel, again, these are like the raw radio velocities. Um, from the pipeline. And so you can see like clear signals for the rotation period, half the rotation period, the long-term magnetic cycle, um, as well as some activity aliases. And then after we apply a correction, we again generate a long scrubble periodogram. And you can see that most of these um, signals corresponding to stellar activity have significantly decreased or are gone. Um, so this is very promising. Um, and we wanted to run an end-to-end -end injection recovery test just as a proof of concept. So we injected a signal of about 0.4 meters per second with a period of 365 days. Um, and so you can see the top periodogram again is just the raw without any kind of corrections where the planet is there, but it's kind of hard to see in the forest of kind of stellar activity signals. Um, and then after we run our neural network, and apply our activity correction, you can see that the planet is a lot more uh, clearly visible and still remains in there and is not removed by the neural network. Um, so you can see the retrieved parameters there as well. And um, this is just the phase folded result for that specific planet. Um, but you now we've talked a lot about HARPS and solar observations. We wanted to see can we actually do this for an exoplanet system? So we had a specific test case of K2167, um, which is one of the brightest stars observed with Kepler. Um, these are the transit observations. Um, and so you can see K2 tests on the bottom here. Um, it has also been observed by Harps North. Um, so this is a figure from Lars. I don't know if I see him, but um, where you can kind of see the um, stellar activity signal is kind of making it very difficult to actually see a clear radio velocity signal. Um, so thus far, no mass had been determined for this specific planet. Um, and we wanted to see whether our method might be able to help. 
Um, however, we can't just apply those kind of neural network methods that I was talking about because this data set is a much, much smaller data set. So we only have about 80 observations. So we wanted to design something that would be a little bit simpler, but still kind of informed based on what we had done before. Um, so what we did instead is design kind of a linear regression approach where we are still using the CCFs, but not the entire thing. We're only using about 10 locations across CCF to try to predict those shape changes that correspond to the solar activity. And so that's these kind of parameters here, and we're trying to learn those weights and then simultaneously fitting for a Keplerian, um, also where the weights would just be your amplitude of your signal. Um, and so the overall radio velocity signal that you would see would be the sum of the Keplerians and kind of the stellar activity contribution. And so you'd be able to disentangle them ideally. Um, and so what we find for this kind of simplified approach is that it does relatively well. Um, so before applying any kind of correction, you get about a 2.3 sigma detection. And then after applying the solar activity correction and removing it, um, we get about a four sigma detection. And this agrees with like the transit um, uh, period and everything as well. Um, yeah, and so beyond Harps North and the Harps North Solar, oh, let me go back for a second. So this is the actual mass that we retrieved from this. And so this kind of simplified method was able to um, find this mass that was previously hidden by stellar activity. Um, Beyond some of the work that we did on that kind of proof of concept planet, as well as Harps North Solar Observations, we participated in Lily's amazing project. Um, and so we kind of applied this similar like linear regression approach um, to the four targets that were selected. Um, and since these only had about 20 to 80 nights of observations, it meant that we kind of even more so simplified our models. Um, rather than using like 10 CCF indices, we only used about five, um, and you can kind of see them indicated in these black lines here, um, trying to really trace where are the biggest shape changes that we see um, for these residual CCFs. Um, something you might notice between all of these residual CCF plots, which is really interesting, is that the shape changes are very different qualitatively for all these different stars. Um, so we're still kind of trying to figure out why that might be, um, but just something interesting to note. Um, for the most active star, um, HD 101501, uh, we found that this kind of linear regression approach reduces the scatter by about a factor of two. Um, and so this is kind of consistent with what we've been seeing in general for these kinds of methods. Um, yeah, here I was going to just highlight the same plot that Louis had and just pointed a little arrow for the ones uh, where we had our method. Um, we also added in H alpha as another indices, just like as another kind of parameter of the linear regression fit did which generally does better than just doing the CCF linear regression, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, I think with that, my main takeaways is that machine learning methods can reduce stellar activity noise by a factor of about 1.7 for the sun. Um, and we found that we could successfully also apply a more simplified method to reveal the mass of a bright extrasolar star. And then this method can also be applied to other instruments like Express and reduce the, fatter, the scatter by a factor of about two. And before I conclude, I have some future directions. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, kind of the next big goals that we have is to apply these methods to a much larger sample of stars that really span the HR diagram. Um, and we're going to be focusing on stars that were selected by the Harps GTO and the Harps Norris Hockey Planet Search Survey. Um, and try to derive metrics for how well stellar activity can be mitigated as a function of like the stellar parameters, like the spectral type, the projected rotational velocity, or the age of the star, and the other parameters if possible. Um, and then what we'll be doing is performing a blind search, looking for planets using a modified Lomb-Scarville periodogram, um, where we try to simultaneously correct for the stellar activity with that simplified linear model that I was talking about. Um, and then after that, the, the dream is to kind of build up a master training set and try to do this for neural networks for like hundreds of stars, um, but removing the planets before as much as we can. Um, yeah, but we're also just very excited to try to maybe collaborate with people and try to see if we can kind of blend some of the methods or combine them, um, like looking at adding, adding extra activity indicators or some of the LSC profiles that we just heard about or Yahara. So yeah, just happy to, happy to work with anybody who would like to climb right. Yeah, thank you. Okay.
questions about the room and then Nathan. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, I might have missed it, sorry. Oh, it's okay. How exactly are you propagating uncertainties throughout your model for the correction? That's a good question. So the neural network models don't actually, aren't like propagating uncertainties when we're training them, or they're not like actually giving any kind of predictions on what the uncertainties are of the cellular activity signal. Is that answer your question kind of? Or, less. or do you mean in the sense of like when, at least when we're doing like the, the MCMC like injection recoveries and things like that, then we do actually like account for the uncertainties that we know from like the Harps North pipeline um, in terms of doing the actual fits for doing like a weighted fit. Yeah. Maybe uh, just a related question, maybe it was, so when you're um, providing your line profiles or your differential line profiles as input to the, either the neural net or the regression code, do you account, do you give them different weights depending on the signal to noise in that particular uh, observation or even if you want to take it further? I know that Eric Ford, for example, has done a lot of work on the covariance structure of the CCF and I wondered if that um, would, would feed in. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I think right now we don't necessarily feed in like specific weights that it should like, actually have for each of the CCFs. But I guess for like the actual neural network models, I would assume that it will actually train and figure out what those weights might should be for like specific locations in the CCF. So rather than putting in specific priors, I suppose, I would assume that the neural network would learn kind of like maybe which indices to dismiss more, or which ones to focus on more. Because um, it is learning all of those weight parameters as it's training on like the hundreds of observations. Yeah. Well, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, if you want to apply, it, if you want to build a training set for uh, a new star for a new instrument, how much work is required? Um, well, I guess like, the main the main kind of challenge with this is also like, oh, okay. So, for building a new pipeline for a new instrument, I would say that's not necessarily something that's we've <laughs> done that for like the express observations, for example, compared to the hard north ones. Um, and I think that that was relatively transferable, but we like did, you know, do kind of like a star by star training approach um, in terms of this like last step of building up like a master training set. Um, I think the difficulty will be making sure that you actually remove as many planet and known planets as possible and that you don't have like so many planets and that are still there that are causing too much noise for like a neural network to be able to learn, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. and and do you think it would work if if you had a, a soap simulation of the type of star that you're looking at? Uh, mm. you, would, you would generate a lot of spectra with soap and and in a sort of sort of standardized uh, environment that you could apply it. So we did do like simulations with soap before we did the Harps North solar analysis. I would say that I don't have it here, but the CCF shapes, like the residual ones, look very very different. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily very transferable in that sense. I would think also for different instruments. I mean, even if you look at like these plots versus like the ones all the way at the beginning, or even for different stars, like the residual CCS look very different. And this is like not subtracting a quiet one, but like subtracting the median instead as a reference. So I, yeah, I. I think you would need a very large data set is one thing, where as many of the planets are removed as possible. And I don't think with simulated like SOAP right now, at least as it is, that it can probably transfer. You can't like, train a neural network on SOAP and expect it to do well on any spectrograph. No, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I remember vaguely from, from, from your paper, uh, first of all, great, great talk. I really enjoyed it. And, and the paper was also quite amazing. But I, I remember vaguely that uh, there was this requirement that you needed um, the quiet star CCF, basically. And I, I was wondering how you, you go around this for, for a star that is not the sun. And then I had a second question, which was um, in the original uh, implementation, I guess not in this one, but you had, so you were inputting the, the whole CCF. And I guess the neural network was sort of selecting where to to learn from or where where to focus uh, could you somehow translate that into a 
a new uh, activity indicator or hints of uh, where in the CCF could we extract information about the activity? Let me answer your first question first about the, the quiet kind of reference. So I think that might be a bit of a misunderstanding. We kind of in the paper subtracted a quiet reference kind of just for visualization purposes. But if you instead like take like a median like across like each indices across CCX and subtract that, it works the same way. It doesn't affect the results. So you don't need a quiet reference to be able to do it. Um, it was honestly just because it was kind of nice for visualization purposes, but it's not required. But, but does that mean you have an implicit requirement on number of observations? I mean, you, you do need like a sufficient number of observations, especially if you want to use the neural networks. Because I mean, I think like, yeah, so we had like 530 observations for like the Harps North Solar data set. It doesn't mean that you necessarily would need that many per star, but you would, if you're going to do it for multiple stars, you would need at least probably some kind of number like that, if not bigger, if there's a lot of different kinds of solar activity you're seeing. Yeah. Um, for your second part of your question, so, so, okay, so you were asking kind of if for um, the CCFs, the, the model is like kind of maybe having different kinds of weights across it, could you maybe create some kind of new activity uh, indicator based on that? So unfortunately, neural networks can be kind of a black box sometimes. There are some methods to try to retrieve specific weights out of it. Um, we haven't tried that right now. I would say that the closest thing that we probably have done is just applying like a linear model where it's very, like for the, for the actual, let me go back, there we go. Um, the easiest thing for now, at least, is to kind of look at this like linear approach and then get like straight weights out. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to be the same thing the convolutional neural network is looking at or the phone connected, but there might be some kind of similarities in terms of what regions it's focusing on or what combination of regions. Yeah, but it would definitely be interesting to kind of maybe apply like Lime or other kinds of methods to kind of take the black box elements out of it as far as possible. Yeah. Maybe. Kind of a similar question for the sim for the like simpler cases where you're picking like five or ten locations for which to sample the CCF. Is there a way that you guys see that analytically finding like the largest standard deviation in the R residuals or something like that? Yeah, so I think we did a couple of things with this. Um, first, like we kind of wrote like a, a genetic algorithm that would just it would it would require that they were separated by like a couple of points because we didn't want them to like choose the same one twice or something like that or too close to them. Um, but yeah, we had implemented like a genetic algorithm to try to look for the best ones. Um, but when we started doing that, we realized pretty quickly that it was overfitting. So we kind of did a combination of like putting in some constraints that it can't just choose like any kind of parameter. They have to be kind of separated as well as doing it by eye because we were kind of concerned about the overfitting aspect. So I think in the future it would be when we have maybe slightly more observations, we could do it a bit more robustly. But yeah. yeah. Heather? Uh, I have two questions. So one of them was, um, I guess, you know, like you're doing a really good job reducing the, the variability using this technique, but from what I understand, there's still some variability that's left that you don't think is from the instrument. And so my question is, what do you think the limiting factor of your approach is at the moment that you can't get that rest of that, you can't capture that? And then my second question was, Knowing what you know about these stars you have here, what do you think is the physics that's driving the difference between those different um, residual profile behaviors that you see? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so for your first question about why can we not drive down to the lower kind of RMS level, what might still be missing in the model? I think that. Mm, it might be something where we could put in more inputs than just the CCF shape. So whether that's like activity uh, indicators or whether it's maybe being inspired by some of Annalise's work and seeing if we could add some of these like kind of delayed activity parameters in there as well. Um, I think that it probably has more to do with not having enough information for the neural network to learn it perfectly than it has to do with the neural network not being complex enough to capture it necessarily. Yeah. But I mean, more observations would also more you know, more data. More data would also be very helpful. It could also be that. Yeah, I'm not sure to be honest. Any of those things would help. <laughs> but yeah. there is fundamentally always going to be 
some contribution of activity signal that does not modify the line profile in a way mm -hmm. that you can distinguish from a radio velocity shift, right? I mean, there's a null space, if you like, in that problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, can, you can produce one if you make some simulations. You can produce some, uh, some patterns on the star that will give you... Uh, they, they will never give you a pure shift, but they will give you something which has a component which is just a shift, right? Mm -hmm. I think. It's almost required from the data perspective. And you also are limited at one point to the resolution that you get. So uh, there are some shifts you will never be able to, to, to prove. Yeah, I was wondering how much of these differences actually come from the difference between the resolution of the instrument and the uh, intrinsic width of the line profile of the star? That's a good question. Because they express it in really high resolution yes. compared to half snow, for example. Yes, at the same time, like the kind of noise at these like edges is much more than if you look at like the there we go, the harps ones here. Like there's a lot mm -hmm. less like of these kind of deformations, I think, of edges compared mm -hmm. to the express ones. Um, but if you subtract as a median, you'd see more at the edge and less in the middle, wouldn't you? Because this is yes, this is the this is like the reference one with the quiet one. But you, what you mainly see is that it will kind of like flip this part downwards. It doesn't necessarily affect the kind of edges as much as that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that is your for online. <coughs> uh, a question from Eric Ford. <laughs> um, <laughs> Have you looked into quantifying how much of what is learned about stellar variability and how much is about the instrument? We've not looked into quantifying that difference. I mean, I guess, I guess when we when we did our, our studies with some of the SOAP like simulated observations, what we saw is that we could pretty much drive down the rooting squared error to like 0.00. .00 three or something meters per second. So like, I think, I mean, I'm not saying that the like the whole like scatter that you end up seeing with like the 1.03 it's not all like contributed by instrumental things, but I think that in terms of the neural network being able to learn a lot of these stellar features and driving it down very low, I think that we can get lower for sure, um, based on like those simulations as well. But we have not kind of, like done any analysis where we try and make the neural network to both predict the stellar activity contribution and the instrumental ins contribution, that would be interesting. Then you would also need an actual number on that per observation, otherwise the neural network would not be able to learn that. So it would be interesting, yeah. I wondered if um, this is gonna, unless there's more questions in the room, this will probably be the last one, but. I wondered if one way, because you mentioned that often you don't quite have enough data to train a full neural network, yes. and I wondered if a way of artificially boosting the amount of data you have is to compute cross-correlation profiles on subsets of the spectra. Mm -hmm. And you could even, you know, randomly generate these subsets, mm -hmm. uh, but then you could arbitrarily boost your data. Now, of course, what you get from different wavelengths Regions will behave slightly differently, but you, you know, ultimately it all contributes to your final average. So mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a way. No, that would be really interesting. Yes. Uh, is, is there time for for a third question? <laughs> 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 Sorry, <laughs> it's just uh, related to to what Heather was asking. So these four stars of the Express, um, I know, so they have different resi uh, different CCF residuals. Uh, did you do you find some correlation between how well the method does in correcting the in reducing the RMS and sort of characteristics of these residuals? Um, so the one that it does the best on is like the most active one, so similar to kind of the other methods that were tried. Um, this one it performs the best on. Um, I think. Hmm. I think this one was also significantly reduced. This is also the one that has like the planet in it as well. Um, so I'm not entirely sure, but I guess these look somewhat more similar just looking at it right now. But I think that we'd have to kind of do some more analysis to be able to get you an answer to that. Yeah. The shape is quite clear, like the, the blue shape, like this. It's like you have a profile that differs, like it's a bit less. 
wasn't done. Mm -hmm. Like as if we should, we are changing, especially for HD ten seven uh, like uh, toxicity. Like this kind of stuff is really when I don't know. The problem is when when you propose not exactly the right one, then you just have these systematic things that appear. I don't know. If mm -hmm. Well, it's like a temperature change. Yeah. This star is changing temperature. Hmm. Uh, whereas the other stars are having more asymmetric distortion. Hmm. What were you going to say? Yeah, but it was based on that. Uh, so the star could change in temperature. I don't think. No, no, I don't mean that really. But yeah, no, no, but okay. But it's also perhaps also instrumental systematics. Uh, because, for example, we see on HARPS over 15 years that uh, the contrast of the CCF change with time. And we know this is because the focus of the instrument change. So we change a little bit the resolution on the detector and then change a little bit the depth of the, of the CCR. So this is quite a small variation over time, but still, there is this effect. So I don't know here how the CCR is stable and affected by instrument systematics. I don't know. Uh, but when we see these uh, things that are like very symmetric, for me, it's more. Mm -hmm. You could try and color it by date. Yes. Well, doesn't even have to be instrument systematic. Like, because if you use the order, CCS is ordered by order, and then you combine them, like, mm -hmm. even if your ADC is working, it's all one day, we take it on a different air mass, like the chromatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So it's able to be relative to the number of adding to the CCS. Yeah. There are also different spectral types, and so you have different CCS masks for them. They have different G sign eyes. There's a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, um, David, and then I think this comment is slightly off topic, but relevant to this question of whether 10700 is a temperature variation, that if Megan just told me that that was the actual seismic target, is that correct? Because if it, if it is a if it is a time series that's dominated by the astro seismic, it should be dominated by a temperature change. Exactly, that's what, that's what the astro seismic mode is. If that is evidence of a temperature change, I bet that's the most precise measurement of temperature change that's ever been made in the history of. <laughs> <laughs> right, because it's going to be uh, uh, much less than a Kelvin. Is it? No, it's a part of 10 to the 4 or something, right, in brightness. And and that's got to be, I don't know, it's got to be on that same order of temperature. It's going to be yeah, they integrate it across the whole program. Like it might not be, but if it is, and you do see the variation. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know. No, but uh, so I don't know. Michael have uh, studied a little bit this. Uh, there is ways to measure temperature by line depth ratios. Sometimes yeah. they're very sensitive, some that are yeah. not, and make a, a ratio between those. And it seems that we are able to measure to the Kelvin level, yeah, for for very short term, uh, yeah, oscillation. Uh, when when we call the oscillation, we are able to to see these type of uh, variations. It also means that we should be able to do astroseismology with multiple modes, not just with the surface velocity, but also the surface temperature. And I think there might be in like an FF prime kind of way of thinking about the astroseismology. <laughs> Maybe even you might be able to see high L's, which are not visible to the country. But it's not the case already. In radio velocity time studies, they're able to go to high L's. But not very high. Not anyway, it would be okay. interesting. Yeah. Okay, I think we should thank her again. Thank you.